Hi, everybody, and welcome. We're going to get the webinar started in just a few minutes. So we'll be with you shortly. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to today's information security webinar brought to you by Fuse Hub in partnership with NYSTAR and AIM. That's the Advanced Institute for Manufacturing. My name is Beth Glasanos, and I am the marketing manager for Fuse Hub. I will be standing in briefly for Everton Henriquez today. Um, we also have Paul Laporte, the cybersecurity coordinator of the Advanced Institute for Manufacturing, who will be doing the majority of the presentation today. As we're going through the presentation, please type in any questions that you have, and at the end of the webinar, we will answer any of those that, that we can within the time frame. Just a reminder, you will be in listen-only mode for the duration of the presentation. Take it away, Paul. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, as Beth introduced me, my name is Paul Laporte. I am the cybersecurity coordinator for the Advanced Institute for Manufacturing. And uh, this webinar today is based around the idea of information security, uh, also known as cybersecurity. Uh, cybersecurity is something that I feel a lot of people realize why it's important, uh, especially with all the things that have been going on in the news recently. But I think that there are some misconceptions as to what exactly cybersecurity is and what is the cost in terms of time and uh, money and uh, manpower to actually protect yourself. And those are some of the myths that we're going to be looking to dispel today. Uh, first, we're going to start off by taking a look at what I like to call the chain of security, which are the individual parts that kind of make up uh, cybersecurity and information security as a whole. Then we're going to be taking a look at the who, why, and what of cyber attacks. So we're going to be looking at the people who are trying to do us harm, why they're trying to, and what they're doing it with. And then uh, last but certainly not least, we are going to be giving a number of tips that you can take home with you today to help protect your company. Just some uh, general uh, cybersecurity uh, tips and information that are not going to cost you a single dollar. You're not going to need to buy any new equipment. Um, it, it's things that you can put in place with your company right now. Okay, so let's take a look at the chain of security. These are the different areas which comprise information security as a whole, and they're broken up into four parts. Uh, the parts are physical, network, policy, and training. Now, the first link in the chain is physical, uh, and that is answering the question, can my information be accessed in the real world? Now, this is something that's rarely associated with cybersecurity at all. Um, normally, you, people just don't connect the dots between a, a lock on the door and how that prevents uh, cyber attacks. But the reality is that if somebody who is trying to do your business harm can physically touch 
the device that they're trying to get information from, or they can figure out some way to plug something into that actual physical machine, the likelihood of that attack succeeding skyrockets. It goes through the roof. So because of that reason, physical security is a very important part of information security overall. Now, the types of devices that would count as physical security devices include a lot of things you would just associate with physical security. Locks, doors, uh, walls, fences, security systems, security guards, uh, particularly large dogs. Um, these all fall under the uh, guise of physical security, preventing somebody from accessing your information in the real world. The next link in the chain is network security. Can my information be accessed by an outside computer? Now, network security is typically what people traditionally think of when they hear the words cybersecurity. This is, this is the traditional attack vector of people coming uh, through the uh, company's network or through the internet to access information uh, purely from a technological standpoint. And the network security devices that help this link of the chain uh, include things that you probably discussed with your IT staff or your IT contractors, things like routers, firewalls, antivirus programs, and things like that. The next link of the chain is policy. Does my company have policies in place to keep my information safe? Now, policy security are rules that are set by management to determine how uh, devices and information are handled. Um, and that is uh, something that uh, companies tend to almost neglect. Uh, they put these, these pieces of equipment in place, they put these physical protections in place, but then they don't write down on paper instructions for people um, in, in regards of how to use them. Um, these policies can determine things like uh, how a company handles usage, usage of cell phones on a shop floor, uh, how a company handles um, whether or not they allow thumb drives or flash drives that you plug into the computer and you can pass information back and forth between. Uh, they determine how long, long a password has to be for a user login and things like that. And implementation of these policies can help support other areas of security. So uh, a password length policy, for example, will help supplement network security. Uh, a policy that requires uh, employees to enter the building by scanning an ID card is a policy that's going to help physical security. So this link really supports all of the other links in the chain. And then the fourth link in the chain is training. Are my employees properly trained to protect my information? Uh, proper employee training allows companies to safely and properly handle company devices and information. Um, one of the biggest myths in cybersecurity is that this is just the responsibility of the IT team or it's just the responsibility of the IT contractor you're working with to keep you safe. The reality is uh, proper cybersecurity knowledge is the responsibility of everybody in the company, from the CEO down to the maintenance worker who just started last week. Everybody has a hand in protecting a company from cyber attacks, and proper training helps them have that knowledge. And the general rule of cybersecurity is that a more knowledgeable staff as a whole is going to increase the overall security of a company. Now, the reason that I call these aspects the chain of security is to go along with the old adage, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. Uh, these are four areas of security that are all roughly equally important. If any one area of this chain is uh, forgotten about or neglected, cyber attackers will exploit that and they will take advantage. Uh, it doesn't matter if you have uh, tens of thousands of dollars of networking equipment and firewalls to protect you from network attacks if you leave your doors unlocked when you when you leave the building and everybody's logged into their computer. Um, it's an extreme example, obviously, but the idea is that in order to have a truly strong security profile, all of these aspects of information security need to be as strong as every other one. Okay, now that we've taken a little bit of a look into what cybersecurity is, let's take a look at who is attacking us. Uh, when we're looking at an attacker, we have to consider uh, the people who are attempting to launch attacks against uh, employees and businesses. And when we do that, we consider three factors. Uh, who is attacking us, why they're attacking us, 
and what they're attacking us with. Now, one of the things that stuck with me early on when I was learning about uh, information security was the SCRAM score. And this is a theoretical um, a set of attributes, a theoretical score that's assigned to uh, people who could potentially be attacking a target. And the higher this score is, the more likely they are going to accomplish that goal. And the SCRAM score is broken down into five different attributes. Uh, the attributes are skills, uh, which is just how, how good are they at the concepts and the practices of cybersecurity itself. Uh, knowledge, which is uh, how much do they know about the target that they're approaching. Resources, how much uh, money and more importantly time do they have to dedicate towards attacking this target. Access, uh, how, how much access do they have to the target itself? Are they able to physically touch it? Do they have any sort of logins that they can use? And most, uh, last but certainly not least, uh, motivation. How badly do they want the attack to succeed? Now, the interesting thing about this acronym is that it's not only uh, highlights the attributes, but it's also a ranking system, uh, with skills being the least important attribute and motivation being far and away the greatest. Uh, there is a saying that the greatest lock in the world is only going to slow down somebody who wants to get in badly enough, and that is absolutely true in cybersecurity. So we're not just worried about the people who are the most technically knowledgeable. We're considering the people who want to do us harm in the worst way. Now with that in mind, we can take that SCRAM score and we can kind of start to design a few different profiles of people who might attack us. Uh, the first one is the foreign hacker. This is somebody who is a security specialist from another country. I'm sure you hear all the time in the news about uh, attacks committed from places overseas. Uh, they're usually done towards big, profitable targets. Uh, these are what everybody thinks of when they hear of a cyber attack because these are the most high profile. These are the ones that you read in the newspapers that you see on the news all the time. These foreign hackers are people who are very high in skill and very high in resources, but they're usually not a big threat to small and medium businesses if basic precautions are taken because their motivation is fairly low. They want to get the most bang for their buck. They want to get the most return for their investment of time, and that may not necessarily be a business that's only has a $250,000 a year revenue stream. These are the people who are going after places like Amazon, like Target, like Walmart. They're the ones that uh, they're really focusing on and they're not necessarily going to be a big threat to you as long as you have just some very basic security in place. Moving on, the next profile we have is corporate espionage. Uh, this is defined as attacks that are committed within the operating area. So if you are a statewide business, this is something that's uh, done within your state. If you're regional, it's within your region. Nation, if you're a national company, it's within your country and so on and so forth. These attacks can come from a variety of places. They can come from competing businesses. They can come from um, angry customers. Uh, it could be somebody trying to resolve a personal grudge against somebody who works at the company. They're trying to do business to the, or they're trying to do harm to the business, to the employees, or to the owners. Uh, what makes a corporate espionage attacker more dangerous than, say, a foreign hacker is they're higher in motivation and they have a greater knowledge of the target. These are people who know about your company because they've had some sort of interaction with it in some direct way and therefore they become considerably more dangerous than that boogeyman that might exist overseas. And finally, we have uh, one that nobody likes to talk about uh, because when you hire somebody, you implicitly are saying that you trust them and you're implicitly saying that they're going to they're gonna do good for your company and, and put their, the needs of your company ahead of the needs of their own. But that's an inside attack. And these attacks are committed by somebody who is employed by the company. And they can fit a number of different profiles. They can be uh, disgruntled employees who are looking to damage the company. They're looking, they could be somebody who is looking to run a parasite business off of your company information or your intellectual property. So they're using your customer list or some sort of special process your company has to make money for themselves and, um, and kind of undermine your business. This is somebody who could be launching an attack for the purposes of blackmail, whether it's for money or for other reasons, or ignoring all those nefarious purposes, it could just be harm caused by accident. 
uh, somebody inadvertently opening an attachment they shouldn't have, and then that, that lets malware onto your network. Uh, these are people who had the best of intentions, but they just didn't have that training or that knowledge and did something that ended up damaging the company. Now, as you can imagine, the inside attack is far and away the most dangerous because motivation is the attacker's only real limit. Uh, they have incredibly high access and knowledge because you gave it to them. You gave it to them in order for them to do their job. They have the keys to the building. They, they know where everything is because they have to do that to, for their day-to-day -day duties. And because of this, an inside attack is far and away the most difficult to prevent. Now that we've taken a look at the people who may potentially be attacking us, let's take a look at their uh, potential motivations. Uh, not all attackers have the same goals when committing an attack. I think a lot of people think that everybody does this for the same reason, but the reality is that um, they tend to be very wide in their motivations. Um, what I've tried to do is to take those motivations and kind of distill them down into what I like to call the three Ps. The three Ps stand for profit, politics, and practice. So attacks done for profit are obviously attacks committed in an attempt to make money. Uh, this can be done in a variety of ways. It could be identity theft, which could either be directly, so they just take someone's identity from the company and just assume it as their own for the purposes of getting credit cards and things like that. Or they could be uh, trying to resell the information. So they get a large amount of the names of employees and their addresses and their social security numbers and then they resell that on some sort of black market for a few dollars a piece. It could be uh, for intellectual property theft, so stealing, again, a customer list or uh, information about a potential patent that a company is working on, and then they use that to sell it to a competitor or for their own financial gain. Uh, it could come in the form of ransom attacks. I'm sure a lot of people have read about the uh, WannaCry ransomware attacks that took place a month and a half or so ago that um, locked down a lot of the uh, healthcare systems in England, and these attacks simply just lock up the information on a computer and don't release it until the owner of the computer pays some sort of ransom, at which point sometimes they'll get the key to unlock that information and other times they won't. But that is uh, absolutely an attack that's done for profit. And in, profit is the main goal of most highly skilled attackers, as you can imagine. If somebody is putting in the time and the skill to do this for a living, then this is going to be what they're doing it for. But it can also come from lower paid employees who feel like they're not being paid what they're worth. Um, one of the more common um, perpetrators of cybercrime tend to be maintenance workers because they have a very high amount of access. They're the lowest paid people in the company generally. And as a result, uh, some very volatile situations can come out of that. The next motivation is politics. These are attacks that are committed by somebody opposed to the business. So think about the NRA, think about Planned Parenthood. These are people that oppose the business for personal and ideological reasons. And the goals of these attacks can be uh, vandalism, so they're trying to smear the reputation of the company, denial of service, they're trying to prevent the company from communicating with the outside world or conducting their day-to-day -day business. Or it can be done for a theft of information for blackmail. So they could try and uh, get into a company's email server and steal some embarrassing emails that a company doesn't want released to the public and then threaten to do just that if uh, demands are not met. Uh, this is usually not done to make any sort of money. It is just because the person attacking that business just doesn't like them and wants them to, uh, wants them to go away. And finally, we have attacks made for practice. Uh, these, are tax, these are attacks that are usually done on small, weak targets by inexperienced attackers, or they're people who are looking to use this smaller target as a dry run for a bigger target. These types of attacks are generally low in skill and motivation. Uh, they're normally easy to defend against with some basic security measures. Uh, the consequences of such an attack uh, tend to be prank vandalism, so linking your website to a porn site, something like that, conducting another denial of service attack to bring down communications, or they could just be doing what's called a look and leave, which is they're just um, seeing what they can get access to for the sake of, of just their own curiosity 
and then they leave and maybe they're going to move on to another target or maybe they're going to they're going to come back with a clearer view of your network but despite the fact that these are generally uh, low threat, they can still be very damaging if left unchecked, and, and that is the reason that you want to at least put basic cybersecurity protections in place. Um, if a robber is walking up and down a neighborhood and turning doorknobs to see which ones are locked and which ones aren't, that's about the extent of what this is, but you want to be sure your doors are locked. And another really fascinating part of cybersecurity is the fact that uh, the software that is used to conduct these attacks, so when you're talking about network attacks or, or attacks in the technological space, um, basically all of it is free. Uh, you can get it very easily on the internet and it can be run on very low quality machines. Uh, one of my favorite devices that I use for testing networks is a netbook I got as a wedding present seven years ago. I think my phone probably has more power in it than that, but it's uh, more than enough to get the job done. Uh, you couple this with the fact that the techniques and information on how to commit attacks with this software is, is very easily accessible and again, completely free on the internet. And the barrier for entry into the hacking world is it's very low. Um, you don't need to go to school to learn how to do this. You don't need to be in a specific part of the world to figure out how to commit an attack. All you really need is access to the internet and again, motivation. Again, showing why it's so important. That's all that really is limiting these attackers from learning the skills that they need to commit their attacks. Now, if you do happen to have a little bit of money hanging around, uh, there are specialized tools out there that are going to make what were once very complex attacks that required a really high amount of skill extremely simple. Uh, there is a device out there that uh, mimics a, uh, a thumb drive or a flash drive. Maybe if you plug it into a computer, it will load itself as a keyboard type of series of keyboard commands that will transfer data to the drive or set up some sort of way for an attacker to access the computer at a later date. That costs about $50. There is uh, on my desk a device that will mimic a Wi-Fi network uh, picture perfectly with their name and their password, kick people off of the old network, and then when it rejoins that device, then the attacker can do all sorts of things as far as gaining information and um, tricking the people on the network into giving them things. That's about $100. These things are pretty much as high as the price tag gets for specialized tools, and it allows people to ha who have very little skill and knowledge to be able to do some pretty, uh, pretty tremendous and scary things. Okay, now that I have everybody out there all good and frightened, let's take a look at some tips as far as how to protect your company. Um, by no means is this a comprehensive list of things you can do, and we absolutely still recommend that you bring in some sort of professional consultant into your company to uh, highlight exactly what your needs are and where the gaps are in your security, but these are some general tips that everybody can take home and consider when uh, looking at the overall security of their, of their company and of their network. So first let's take a look at the concept of least privilege. Least privilege is the idea that users only have access to the information they need to perform their duties. So if somebody in the accountant department is working, they only have access to accounting files. Uh, if somebody is in human resources, they only have access to HR files and so on and so forth. And this increases security for a couple reasons. The first being that if an outside attacker gets access to an employee's account, then they can only really do anything with in that department that that employee happens to be in. Um, the other reason is that if we're talking about inside attacks, if somebody in a department does decide to do something nefarious, not only do they only have access to their department, but it's gonna be a lot easier to root them out if only people in accounting have access to the accounting folder, as opposed to if everybody in the company had access to the accounting folder. And if you want to actually sit down and talk with your IT contractor or your IT team, you can add an extra layer of security by not just um, restricting permissions for employees so they only have access to certain files, but you can actually put these departments on completely separate networks, which will uh, just 
make it that much more difficult for an attacker to get to another part of the network. And then lastly, when we're talking about least privilege, and this is one that uh, CEOs and administration don't like to hear so much, but uh, restrict installation of software to just your IT team. Nobody else but uh, your IT team or your IT contractor should be able to install software on company machines. Uh, yes, it can be a hassle if you need a piece of software to work on a job for a client and you have to wait to get approval from IT and you have to wait for somebody to come in and actually install it, especially if you work with a contractor and they're not there every day. But the reality is the inconvenience is going to increase your security by a huge amount because a very small amount of people are able to do anything to a computer that might potentially harm it and that's just the IT team who have already have control of everything. All right, moving on, let's take a look at the concept of resource placement. Um, again, going back to physical security, this is the idea of putting important technological devices in physically secure areas. So if you have a company server in your building, you want that server in a locked room or at the very least a server closet that's locked, which is just basically a cabinet that is meant to house running computer equipment. Uh, and you want to put this server in a location where there isn't a lot of foot traffic and, and, and isn't normally accessed by a lot of people in the company. Again, if they can't get their hands on it, it's a lot harder to get the information they're looking for. Uh, if the company has a Wi-Fi network, you want to make sure that your Wi-Fi routers are placed in some sort of central location to minimize a signal carry outside of the building. I've been in companies where they put the Wi-Fi router on an, an upstairs office near the window and it broadcasts that Wi-Fi signal all the way across the street completely out of range of security cameras or eyes of anybody on the company so people can just you know sit across the street in their car and uh, do their work to try and get inside your network. If you have any uh, laptops that are assigned out to people who are working from home or on the road, uh, you want to make sure that those are kept secure, that there's some sort of inventorying system for those. And when somebody takes them out to use them, you want them to sign out that laptop and say when they, when they brought it out, when they brought it back in. And the reason for that is that if there is an issue on one of these laptops, then you can get a clear picture of who was using it and what they were using it for, so you can try and figure that issue out. And uh, last but not least, uh, PCs that are not currently in use, that don't have an employee in front of them, should be either locked or they should be logged out. Uh, locking a machine takes less than a second. You hold, you hold down the Windows key, you hit L, the computer is locked, and then you need a password to get back in. Uh, you, your company should get in the habit of uh, having every employee do this every time they get up and move away from their computer. Because again, if they leave the computer, then somebody there can physically access that computer. Um, and if it's somebody that doesn't normally have uh, credentials to that department or that network, that can obviously be a problem. And then they're also uh, committing their acts as this person that they're logged in as. So it's it's tougher to find out the source of the attack and the source of the problem when that sort of things happens. Uh, if you do work with an IT staff or an IT team, you can actually uh, set uh, your server to automatically uh, lock or log out a PC after a certain amount of time. And generally we recommend that if a PC is going to be um, if somebody's going to be away from a PC for about a half hour, you can just go ahead and lock it. But if it's any longer than that, you should probably just uh, log out completely and then have the user log back in when they're, uh, when they're back at their desk. All right, let's talk a little bit about strong passwords. Uh, strong passwords should be lengthy and they should be complex. Uh, they should be a minimum of eight characters long. Uh, generally, it's better at this point if you have them be 12 characters long, but uh, eight is the absolute minimum you should be looking at. These passwords should contain uh, a combination of uppercase letters, lowercase letters, numbers, and special characters like exclamation points, at symbols, uh, pound signs, ampersands, things like that. The password should not be an already existing word or somebody's name. Uh, you should change the passwords every 60 to 90 days. Uh, generally, we recommend that if it is 
an account that is just being accessed by one person, you can change it every 90 days or so. If it's something like a company Wi-Fi password that you're giving out to clients who come in, we, uh, we recommend that you change that every 60 days or so. Also, passwords should be different from the previous two to three passwords you've had on that system. So don't just try and don't allow people to just enter the same password again, time and time again, it defeats the purpose. Also, the passwords should be different from other passwords elsewhere that the person might have. So your password to log into your company machine should be different than your password for Facebook. And that should be different than your password for Amazon. And that should be different for the password for the sports blog that you go to. Because if any of those places get compromised, now they don't just have the, the password for that place, they have your password for everything. And accounts should be locked after three to five failed attempts. So if somebody tries to get into a user account and they input the incorrect password three to five times, that account should be locked and then it can't be unlocked until somebody from the IT team or an IT contractor unlocks that for you. And again, this is, this is where things can get a little bit inconvenient, but uh, the security of that is definitely going to be worth it in the end. Now let's take a look at what a, a sample strong password might look like. Um, instead of thinking of a word or someone's name or a date, uh, think of a phrase. Uh, start with a phrase that's familiar to you. Um, something from a line from a movie or a song lyric or, or something along those lines, something from a book you've read. Uh, for this example, we're going to use uh, the quote, we have nothing to fear but fear itself by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Once you have that phrase, uh, use the initials from the words in the phrase to kind of get your base for your password. So in this case, I had FDR, the person who said it, and then W-H-N-T-F-B-F-I. Once you have that, um, that initial password base, uh, do what we call uh, character substitution and add capital letters uh, in there as well. So as you can see, I took that phrase and change it to this with the capital FDR, and then I put some capital letters in here, and I substituted the T in two for the number two, and I substituted the the B in uh, but with the number eight, and uh, the I in itself for an exclamation point. So just get creative with it. Do whatever seems to make sense to you or, or what works in your head. And then uh, just to show and demonstrate what kind of a difference that makes. Uh, I have uh, a site here really quick that we're going to take a look at called How Secure Is My Password? Um, what this is, this is a website that will tell you how um, quickly a computer program can guess your password by uh, either hacking tools or just uh, guessing a random assortment of numbers and letters. So if you use something like password, it's going to get it instantly because password is an incredibly commonly used password. Um, if you use something like uh, the current date, so 07262017, that's going to get it in three milliseconds. I guess that's a little bit better. <laughs> um, if we use uh, the passwords we, uh, we discussed before, so if we just used everything lowercase and all of the, all of the same letters, that, that FDR, WHN, TF, BFI, then it will do the following. So FDR, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. That brings us up to about a day for a, uh, a computer, a regular computer, to try and guess by guessing random characters. Now, if we go and do the character substitution with capital letters that we talked about, FDR, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Now we're up to a computer taking 400 years to try and guess it. So that, that just shows you and gives you a very clear example of how a strong and secure and complex password can really make the difference in um, computer software uh, trying to get into your network um, unauthorized. And if you want to take the last extreme example, this really only works for websites because they don't have this for just like Windows logons, but uh, you can use a password manager, something like LastPass, which I have here, that will uh, generate completely random passwords for you and then store them all in a vault that you unlock with a master password. 
And if you do that, that's just a, an assortment of 24 random numbers and characters. And if we paste that in, it's going to take one octillion years for that to break. So again, when we're developing a strong password, the two things that are the most important are length and complexity. Think of a phrase that you, that you know and you're comfortable with, substitute those characters, add in capitalization. Um, sure, maybe you'll forget it the first couple times or you'll maybe maybe have to write it down. We don't recommend that, but still uh, complexity definitely matters. Now we spent a lot of time talking about stopping uh, people from uh, accessing our network and our information without our permission. But uh, information security also covers disaster recovery. This is the idea that we're protecting our information in the event uh, that something terrible happens that isn't necessarily uh, instituted by a you know, initiated by a person. So if our building catches fire or there's a power surge through our through our offices that destroys all of the equipment, what do we do? And there's a, a number of things you can do to protect yourself against that. Uh, the first and far and away the most important is scheduling regular backups of your server. Um, if you have a centralized server that you're storing all your information on, you absolutely positively need to back that up. And what we recommend generally is to do three separate backups on a schedule of one running every month, one running every week, and then run one running every day. Uh, that way, if you have something that happens to your network or uh, some piece of information that you need to get back that you didn't realize was gone for a few days, you can go back to the previous weeks. And if it's something that was a, a couple of weeks old, you can go back to last months. Uh, so you have a few different checkpoints uh, throughout your, uh, your company's server history that you can go back to. And then when you do these backups, uh, you can either store them up in the cloud through a service like Carbonite or even something like um, Dropbox or Google Drive. There's, there's a lot of really great services out there. Or you can just go the, the old-fashioned way and just uh, store them on a few external hard drives and then just keep those uh, stored off-site or, or locked away in a, in a deposit box somewhere. Those are all viable options. You can do it a pretty wide variety of ways. We just really strongly emphasize and recommend that you do backups. They're so, so important. And uh, additionally, rather than looking just at digital information, we should also be trying to uh, back up our paper documents as well. Because if, you're, if your company does a lot of work with paper, or even if they don't, and they just use it for employee records and things like that, if the office catches fire and all those papers go away, you you could be your company could be down for a while. You could have some issues there. So what we recommend you do is that you digitally scan those paper documents and store them on your server, which is then backed up. And when I recommend this to companies, a lot of people say, well, my company is 20, 30, 40 years old. We have decades and decades of paper to back up. And I say, don't worry about that. Start today. And you can get to that stuff somewhere down the line, or even if you never do, if something happens a year from now, at least you'll have your paper documents backed up from going back a year as opposed to nothing being backed up at all. So start today, get some sort of plan in place to scan in your paper documents and store those on your server. And then speaking of plans, in general, you want to just develop a disaster recovery plan for your company. You want to get the heads of various departments together. You want to talk to them about what information is the most important and in the event of some sort of disaster, what you need to get access to the quickest to get your business back up and running. And you need to discuss how you're going to do that and how you're going to protect that information and actually write this plan down in a book. Um, actually have a physical notebook that is a disaster recovery plan and then have some people on your staff know this plan and know what to do in the event that something happens. If you have somebody who is, say you have a small IT staff and you only have one administrator and they have access to all of the administrator passwords for everything in your company, uh, that administrator should put some sort of record of those passwords and those usernames in this recovery plan just in case, God forbid, something happens to that person then you're not locked out of all of your systems and you can go about your normal day-to-day -day business. And we talked a little bit about it earlier, but another very, very important part of information security is making sure that you have a clear company policy. Your company policy discusses benefits, it discusses 
uh, you know, sick time. It discusses all of this, all of the steps and processes that your employees are supposed to abide by on a day-to-day -day basis. There absolutely needs to be some sort of IT policy within that documentation. Uh, those policies should uh, outline things like how long passwords are and how often they have to be changed. They should outline things like how uh, how people can use company email servers, what they can have join the company Wi-Fi network, whether they can have personal devices or only company devices, um, how mobile phones are allowed and should be used uh, on the company floor or next to sensitive information. If the company assigns laptops or cell phones, um, what's the proper policy for those being used? And most importantly, if something goes wrong, who do they tell about it? Uh, incident reporting is something that should absolutely be outlined and employees should at all times know who they need to talk to if something weird happens. Um, almost every single cyber attack that's ever been committed, someone somewhere along the way within the company saw something and said, ah, eh, that's not my problem or yeah, it's probably fine. It's probably nothing. You want to encourage people to report incidents as soon as they happen, and they should know exactly who they need, they need to report that to. And continuing on with the idea of employee knowledge, a proper training is extremely important. Uh, you want to do a formal employee orientation for any and all new hires. Um, a lot of companies, when they hire somebody, they just have the person that they're replacing train them or somebody else from within the department. You should, for the, term, for the purposes of security, have that person sit down with a member of the IT team or a member of human resources, and they should step-by-step -step go through the company's IT and information security policy with them and explain why each of these policies are important. And when they're doing this, they should also emphasize to both new and existing employees awareness over punishment. Um, one of the things that companies do is they will you know, say to an employee, well, if something gets installed on our network and we find out it was you that did it, uh, you're fired. And the problem with that is that if an employee installs something by accident through like a, a bad attachment or something like that, um, they're not going to tell anybody because they're afraid for their job. And that's going to allow that software to populate throughout the entire network, whereas it might have just been limited to that one device if the employee wasn't uh, afraid for their livelihood. You should also take the time to retrain your employees once to twice a year on your security and your IT policy. Um, you should update them on any changes that may have been made to that policy in the last one to two years, you know, in the last year. Uh, they should be, it should act as a refresher for any existing policies that maybe the employees weren't aware of. And it also helps identify uh, trouble spots and get rid of bad habits. So if a certain department thought that the policy said one thing and it turns out that that's wrong and it really says something else, that's when you can kind of clarify those issues and uh, root out potential problems before they ever happen. All right, so wrapping everything up, uh, there's just a couple things I want everybody to take away from this presentation. The first is that strong information security is everybody's responsibility. Again, from the owner of the company down to the new hire or the maintenance guy, it is the responsibility of everyone within the company. Uh, it's also important that the entire chain of security has to be strong. You have to look at physical security. You have to look at network security. You have to make sure your policies are sound. You have to make sure your employees are well-trained. All of those things are equally as important, and if any of them lag behind, it is a weak spot for your company. You also want to make sure your company has a disaster recovery plan put in place in the event of some sort of natural or man-made disaster. They're going to be able to know what to do and take the steps needed to get back on their feet as quickly as possible. And last, but certainly not least, awareness is key. Awareness and communication are the enemies of cyber attackers. If you see something strange, and you need to recognize that it's not the way it's supposed to be, and you need to tell somebody about it. And just that line of communication from the employees to the IT team to the administration is going to go so far in making sure that your company stays protected. All right, at this time, I'm going to open up the floor, and if anybody has any questions, then we're going to answer them right now. 
Okay, well, uh, we have a couple of questions that have been submitted during the webinar. The first, Paul, is I would like assistance beginning my own information security plan. How do I get that started and can you help? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, that, that is the, the short answer. Uh, the long answer is that depending on uh, the region that you're in, uh, you may need to contact rather than uh, the Advanced Institute for Manufacturing directly. You might need to contact whoever your MEP center is in your region, and then either they will have somebody who can uh, help you with that process, or they can get in contact with us, and then they can bring us in, and then we can help you with that. But uh, you can do it through uh, the MEP system, which we recommend. I mean, obviously, I work from, I'm going to recommend that, but we are a nonprofit. Um, and the cost for these services tends to be much, much lower than if you were to go through a private company. So yeah, absolutely, I would recommend that if you're interested in this, get in touch with the company, uh, AIM ourselves, we offer a free uh, one hour level one assessment. So we'll come in, we'll just kind of take a quick look and tour your building and make some recommendations. And then from there, you can go uh, kind of up the ladder and do kind of um, processes that might take a couple days. And then we give you a very in-depth prioritized list. And then uh, if you don't have anybody as far as a contractor or a team you work with for information technology, we can also help you implement solutions as well. Okay. Uh, I believe you touched upon this briefly, um, but someone had asked, uh, can you address the recent ransomware attacks? Sure. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, the WannaCry ransomware attack, and I believe that there was another one after that, um, but basically they, they just effectively did the same thing. Um, they are just trying to uh, cause disruption for money. Um, I've actually had some personal hands-on experience with different types of ransomware, and that's really the goal is to just get uh, a few dollars. It's usually never more than a couple hundred dollars from a wide variety of people. Uh, and then make your money through volume. Uh, unfortunately, when it does happen, depending on the type of software, sometimes there's ways to reverse it, sometimes there's not. Uh, in any case, we never, ever, ever recommend that you pay that ransom. Uh, number one, it uh, shows cyber attackers that this is a viable means to make money. And number two, they may not give you the information to unlock your data. They may just take the money and run off. Uh, they're thieves. Don't trust them. Uh, the best uh, thing you can do to combat ransomware is, again, making sure your data is backed up and then separated from your network. So if something like that does happen, then you have you can just kind of erase your servers, reinstall the backup, and then you're right back to where you were before any of this happened. Okay, next question. Uh, regarding departments on separate networks, is routing between VLANs recommended? Yes, absolutely. Um, depending on the type of complexity of your networking equipment, um, some, some corporations or some companies, if you're very small and you don't have business grade um, networks, networking equipment, you may not be able to do this. But if you have networking equipment that allows you to create VLANs, which are basically just um, virtual networks existing on one networking device, uh, yeah, that we absolutely recommend that. And that's what we generally do whenever we are creating sub networks for a company, if they have that ability. And, and as a matter of fact, it's, it's really kind of impractical to do anything else. Like we don't want you buying three separate routers for your three separate networks. Um, we would recommend just getting a good business class one and then setting up VLANs for those different departments. All right, for our last question, we have, um, are password programs and apps secure? Uh, and that is an excellent question, and you absolutely should be asking that. Um, there are some, there have been some general small issues with uh, different programs in the past, and you should absolutely do your research on that. Um, however, for the most part, these uh, password management um, programs and applications, uh, they're secure for the reason that they don't actually keep your master password stored anywhere. So I'll give you an example with LastPass. Um, I had neglected using it for years, and then when I went back to use it, I didn't remember my password, and I contacted the company and said, hey, can you reset my password for me? And they were like, no. Um, long story short, they don't store your actual master password on their servers. They store what's called a hash on their servers. So it's a bunch of garbage 
uh, in terms of data that just happens to match the garbage that you put in when you type your password. But if somebody were to just pull that file off of a, a password management company servers, they would have no way of reverse engineering that to your password. So um, I, if you can remember these passwords and keep track of them in your own head and not use that, um, I would say go with that. But I like the idea that you can do very, very long and complex passwords and keep them on a password manager. Um, just make sure that your actual master password is very complex itself and you should be good. Well, this is Everton. I want to thank you, Paul. Thank you, Beth. And I thank you, everyone, for joining us. Just want to add something to what Paul just said before in answer to a question. If you have the need for services, please feel free to contact FuseHub. Uh, we will then coordinate through the MEP Center. FuseHub is the statewide MEP Center, and as such, we do the matching for all the MEP centers across the state. So please feel free to contact us, and we'll direct you to the, uh, the appropriate center if you're not in um, the center that um, Paul's uh, organization is in. Um, but thank you again, and um, the information for both Paul and myself was reflected earlier in the slide, and you um, should remember to keep the conversation going, and you can contact, contact us at that location, and we'll be more than happy to help you. Once again, thank you very much.